Welcome to Badass Stories from Byzantium, the podcast where I tell the woe and WTF parts of the Byzantine Empire's history, an underexplored and often overlooked subject in Western popular culture. I am your host, Keith Hernandez, and I hope to gently guide you out of the warm embrace of philosophical mothers and into the boiling hot cauldron of medieval napalm. Come with me to northern Italy, where a fox is hunting. The Italian sun bore down on two lordly men as they urged their horses slowly toward each other at the base of a hill. One of them, a nobleman called Guillemus Mascabales, wore a gold-threaded maroon tunic over a chainmail shirt, a faded green kite shield at his back, a sword at his hip, and a jeweled ring on each finger. He shone brilliantly in the sunlight, as if he were some heavenly representative sent to be exalted, but his cocked, disappointed expression and soul-searching eyes brought him closer to earth. He was not sent from heaven, but came on his own accord to forgive the man in front of him, who, despite only wearing a dirty cloth tunic, looked as dangerous as all of Galeamus's bodyguards put together. The stout, unarmed, and unarmored man, known as Robert Gisgar, put out his right hand and nodded his head. I've come to apologize, father. It was wrong of me to raise arms against the man who gave me such a beautiful bride and a castle. After all this bloodshed, I have learned the error of my ways. Gilliamus let out a sigh and shook his son-in-law's hand. You have disappointed me so, but I would make peace to see my daughter again. The two men turned their horses out of the tree line and up the hill, talking all the while. After a few paces, the regal man noticed a shimmer coming from the top of the adjacent hill. Robert, too, noticed this. Why should we tire ourselves out seated on horseback? Robert asked, stealing his father-in-law's gaze. Shall we dismount and sit on the ground? Then we can consider what we have to in comfort. Gilliamus eyed Robert suspiciously, but thought better of the warning in his heart. Robert wouldn't dare harm him, he thought. He was a powerful, well-connected man who obviously had no problem letting lesser men leech off of himself, and his bodyguards were nearby at the base of the hill. The two then dismounted, and Robert sat on the ground. The bodyguards for the maroon-clad man too dismounted, and sat against the trees at the base of the hill, for respite against the heat. Robert began once Gilliam has seated himself. I take responsibility for the war that has torn this family apart. You are not only my father, but my liege lord, and I will do better in the future to live up to my duties. It's true the man was sorry, for the war was never going to end in his favor, what with Gilliamus' endless wealth. Whatever his intentions, he must have truly wanted a way out of this. The thought reassured the old man, and he leaned on his side with his elbow against the ground as he considered his son-in-law's pledge. It was at this moment that Robert's expression switched from solemn to furious, and the young man lunged unto his father-in-law. Gilliamus tried in vain to reach for his sword, but had to use both hands to keep Robert's from his neck. It began to roll down the hill. Gilliamus' bodyguard mounted and rushed toward the struggling lord, but before they reached him, four men rushed out of the woods and grabbed and bound Gilliamus, dragging him towards the other hill. One of the four men tossed Robert a spear and shield, which he used to slow their pursuers, killing one horseman with a single blow. Robert himself might have been killed, if not for the dozens of fully armored horsemen that now appeared at the adjacent hill. The rest of Gilliamus' bodyguards fled at the sight. The old man would lose all of his teeth and eyes in the castle he had gifted his son-in-law, while Robert would become rich and powerful, using the old man's usurpation to conquer Italian city after Italian city, until a more tempting target to the east would catch his eye, thus planting the seed for the end of the civilized world, one that had just barely escaped the jaws of antiquity. I wanted to start today's episode off with this story, which was handed down to us from Anna Komnena, historian and daughter of Byzantine Emperor Alexios I Komnenos, because its themes run parallel to the story I'm about to tell. To be clear, in the story I just told, I used my own words and added decoration here and there, though some of the dialogue was word for word what Komnena wrote, according to the ERA Suter translation at least. Not only do the story's themes run concurrently, 
but an argument can be made that Komnenos' tale is the logical beginning to today's tale, because the seed I mentioned will grow into a world-changing event, at least for the Christian and Muslim worlds. For today's episode, I want to tell the story of the 1204 CE sack of Constantinople, which was the culmination of what is commonly known as the Fourth Crusade. I also want to tell the story of the Byzantine Empire's reclamation of the city. So it won't all be tears. However, in order to tell it all correctly, I will have to back up a century and some change. It's a sad story, but ultimately a compelling one, because it's a story of idealism colliding with reality. For a large portion of the Roman Empire's two millennia, it married the two by force. And though much smaller and weaker by the late 11th century, the empire was still a force to be reckoned with. Yet the world was growing around it, and the superiority complex wasn't going to stop that. The Latins to the west, chiefly the Normans, lusted after the empire, and ate away at it every chance it could get. Their encroachment, in addition to the schism in 1054 that divided the two great churches, would eventually lead to a great distrust between what remained of the Roman Empire and those who inhabited its ancestral homeland. The Seljuk Turks in the east were eating away at Anatolia at the same time. In a matter of decades, you can watch the empire contract due to losses from what they considered barbarians. They were learning the hard way they were no longer the big kids on the block, and the smaller kids were getting bigger every day. We start in the late 11th century because it was the beginning of the end for the empire. Losses in Italy and Anatolia following 1071 will start a trend of reversals, sprinkled by short-lived comebacks that will culminate in the Fourth Crusade and the empire's fragmentation. This event will emaciate the empire until its final fall in 1453. As I previously announced, this will be the first of three episodes dealing with Byzantine identity and the context of the empire's decline. Chiefly, I want to examine who the Byzantines were, how they experienced the end, and where they went afterwards. Maybe an argument can be made that they are still among us. But before I get too far ahead, let's start simple. Who were these people? What made a Byzantine a Byzantine? First, the Byzantines wouldn't have called themselves the Byzantines. They understood they were the continuation of the Roman Empire, and therefore called themselves Romans. The word Byzantine came into fashion as a way to designate the eastern half of the Roman Empire after the fall of the West. Second, it is important to know that the Byzantine Empire was a multi-ethnic state. Sure, there was an ideal Eastern Roman, but the empire ran hundreds of miles east and west at any given time throughout most of its history, and therefore contained countless peoples moving to and fro. These included Latins from the west, Slavs from the north, and Armenians from the east, just to name a few. These peoples came from different geological areas with different ways of life, and religion, and even language. However, they all assimilated to a certain degree, some less than others, to the Constantinople-centric empire. The main identifier, what made any of these people Roman, was their allegiance to the emperor. That's not to say an imperial subject made everyone equal. There was an ideal Eastern Roman with identifiers that made such a person more Roman than others. According to historians Helene Arweiler and Angeliki Leu, the quintessential Byzantine went as follows. You were a Greek-speaking, Orthodox Christian man of Greek ethnicity. If we were to use these quintessential identifiers, as people were and ought to do, as baselines, then all people outside of them are foreign to one degree or another. This was especially so in the Byzantine Empire, where to paraphrase Arweiler, the people clung to their glorious Roman and Hellenistic past, and where anything that did not remind them of that was barbaric. In this way, the past gave the Eastern Romans a superiority complex that shaped their view of foreigners, both inside and outside the empire one that would come to bear as the Byzantines fought the various steppe peoples whom they considered the ultimate other, being outside of history and civilization. The Turks, who they abhorred for their worship of Islam and conquest of the Byzantine land, and the Latins, with whom they wrestled for imperial and spiritual preeminence in Europe. Now that we have a basic idea of who the Byzantines were and why they saw barbarians everywhere, let us begin with our journey to the Fourth Crusade and beyond. And let me be clear, I'm about to generalize more than a century of happenings, and will probably skip over events you may feel are more important. My goal here is to point out some of the more key elements, within and without Byzantium, that will lead to the empire's crisis of identity, and, well, existence, in 1204. 
Our story begins in April 1071, when the Byzantine presence in Italy came to an end after the Normans, once used as fierce mercenaries in the Eastern Roman army, took the seaport of Bari. Over the next few decades, the Normans, under the command of Robert Guisgar and his son Bohemond I, would repeatedly invade the Balkans and Greece. To say Guisgar lusted after the empire is an understatement, as Anna Comnena suspected he not only wanted to conquer Byzantium, but also wanted the imperial title. The attacks would become something of a tradition for the Normans during and after Guisgar's life, prompting the Byzantine emperors with their waning emphasis on naval production to seek help. In doing so, they granted Venetian merchants concessions and their own quarter within Constantinople in exchange for Venetian naval power. If the loss of Bari was all that it was to befall the Byzantine Empire in 1071, the empire just may have had a chance to bounce back. It might have gathered its strength from Anatolia, which had long bolstered the Byzantine ranks and reconquered southern Italy. It was unlikely such a disaster would happen twice in the same year, but it did. In the east, four months after the fall of Bari, an entire imperial army was wiped out by the Seljuks at Mansikert in Anatolia. Over the next decade, Asia Minor was engulfed by the Seljuks. If you recall my last episode about the Varigian Guard, Emperor Romanus IV's Norse bodyguard died to a man protecting him in that battle. No major gains or reconquests were made after this time. Because of the losses to the east, and in spite of losses to the west, Emperor Alexios I Komnenos turned to his Latin neighbors again for help. I'm reminded here of the trope in which vampires need an invitation to enter somebody's home. And we know from Anna Komnenna that her father was very weary of inviting foreign armies. But with the loss of his Anatolian recruiting ground, he had little choice. Thus, the First Crusade was called in 1096 in response to Alexios I's appeal to Pope Urban II to help reconquer land from the Seljuks. Now, before this event, the act of crusading was thought not so much as a military campaign, but as a pilgrimage, in which soldiers took part more so to protect those making the pilgrimage. It is thought even our famous Viking friend Harald Harjada took part in these pilgrimages. But Pope Urban II, like those after him, would turn the idea of a crusade into something more violent, uniting the role of the pilgrim and soldier into one, a crusader. These crusaders would, at the Pope's behest, lead a sort of defensive holy war to protect Christians in the East and recover and protect holy places in exchange for the remissions of sins, among other rewards. The Byzantines, of course, didn't quite ask for all of that, but nonetheless accepted whatever help they could get. They saw no holiness in warfare, what with the death and destruction it brings. According to historian George T. Dennis, the Byzantines were the true defenders of Christianity as far as they were concerned. Dennis writes in The Defenders of the Christian People, The Byzantine attitude toward war can be best understood in the context of the way in which they viewed the world and life in general. The world and the life it bore were fragile and transitory. The only permanent reality was to be found in another world, the kingdom of heaven. The empire on earth was a mere reflection of that in heaven, and the emperor was called to initiate the lord of heaven. Under God, he was to assure the well-being of his subjects and protect them from all dangers, within and without. The church had a different role. Jesus told his followers that he could call upon legions of angels and save himself from death, but he did not do so, and neither would his church. Unlike its Latin sister, the Byzantine church left the call to arms and the waging of war, even against the most pernicious and destructive heretics and infidels, to the imperial government. All that to say the idea of a crusade, like their western neighbors, was foreign to the Byzantines and the emperors would soon come to regret Alexios I's invitation. In fact, the Western Latin armies would focus more on Palestine and keep almost all of their gains to themselves, despite pledges of fealty to Alexios I before he granted them passage across the Bosphorus. And, of course, the Normans of all people were on the invite list, which begs the question, how the hell did the Byzantines have any trust in the Latin West, even now? I think in part, it plays into their notion of superiority over their lesser cousins, but also their shared sense of kinship. They were both Christians after all, though of different persuasions, from the lands previously within the Roman Empire. And while the Byzantines have been warring with some of the more aggressive kingdoms in the Latin West since the fall of the Western Roman Empire, looking at you Lombards and Franks and Normans, they have not felt the existential need to write off their cousins. Yet. 
Over the next century, it seems the Latin West will do everything in its collective power to earn the ire of the Byzantines. Gisgar's son, Bohemond I, will invade in an attempt to subdue the empire in 1108 on his way to Syria. The Normans will ravage Greece in 1147 after the Muslim capture of Edessa, the subsequent beginning of the doomed Second Crusade. All of this occurs while the Byzantines' relationship with Venice turns sour. The naval power will demand by force more concessions in 1122, with the Venetian siege of the island of Corfu in the Adriatic. Growing animosity between the two states will culminate in the arrest of Venetians across the empire in 1171 under Emperor Emmanuel Komnenos and a decisive Byzantine victory in the coming war. Now, it may not seem like it, but emperors were learning from their mistakes. Most importantly, after the Second Crusade, they learned that they must not allow another crusade to form. Instead, they would look to diplomacy with their eastern neighbors to help with reconquest in Anatolia. By 1161, the Seljuks and the Danishmans, a neighboring Anatolian state, were warring for the peninsula's eastern holdings. The coastal areas along the Mediterranean, Aegean, and Black Seas, as well as a large portion of western Anatolia, were again in eastern Roman hands by this point, which the Crusaders do deserve some credit here for. Though it was the Empire's goal to strike a balance between the two Turkish states, they favored the Seljuks because the Danishmans were more committed to jihad. Now, that is not to be confused with the western idea of holy war. For the Muslims, holy war was not as defensive in nature as the Crusades were said to be. For a general definition of this kind of warfare, I defer again to the words of an expert, as I don't even feel qualified to paraphrase it. Visiting Dennis again, he writes on the subject, Jihad is a religious duty for the Muslim community to propagate Islam, employing coercion of various sorts as needed, until the whole world professes to Islam or its subject laws. At times, especially when the caliph or other religious authority proclaims it, this obligation takes the form of armed conflict. Just as with the idea of crusading, the Byzantines abhorred this notion of violence and holiness intermingling. With that in mind, Emperor Emmanuel I agreed to finance the Seljuk Sultan's war against the religiously motivated Danishmans in exchange for the return of Byzantine land in 1161. However, a similar sounding story would play out. After the Seljuks defeated their adversary, they kept the land they conquered and united Turkish Anatolia. The last major attempt to take back this land by force would end in a major Byzantine defeat in 1176. I know this has moved at a pretty quick pace, so let's take stock of the situation thus far. The Normans in Italy, by now the Kingdom of Sicily, have battered the Byzantines in the West for a century forcing the latter into an increasingly one-sided alliance with the Venetians, whose traders with their quarter and special privileges within Constantinople have become the envy of the Roman people, especially the poor who have been bearing the financial burden of constant warfare. In the east, the Byzantines have reclaimed western Anatolia and areas along the coast, but are unable to extend any further, due in part to Seljuk deception. The empire is in a total bind by 1171. There are those in the West who are itching for an opportunity to take Constantinople, which they see not only as a hindrance to the Crusades, but also a tempting target. It doesn't help things that the death of Manuel I is followed by instability within the empire and the rise of new kingdoms from without. Stefan Nemanja will found the Serbian monarchy in 1180, and the Bulgarian kingdom will reform in 1186. Both kingdoms will eventually request and receive legitimacy from the Pope, much to the detriment of the Byzantine emperors. The encroachment of these kingdoms have created new threats along an already dangerous border for the landowning Byzantine elite, who are increasingly relying on their own resources rather than the empires to protect themselves due to a shortage in imperial manpower and money. A succession of incompetent emperors after Manuel I will only exacerbate the Byzantine Empire's precarious situation. If all that wasn't bad enough, relations with the West were fast approaching an all-time low. Manuel I's son, Alexios II, ever partial to the Latins, was overthrown by Andronikos I Komnenos in 1182, and the coup resulted in the massacre of Venetians, what with their special status within the empire and other Latins within Constantinople. And if you guessed another Norman conquest was in order, you guessed right. The Normans, never quite letting their eyes out the prize, took Thessalonica and Dyrrhachium in 1185, 
fearful that Constantinople was next, and Jonikos was overthrown by Isaac II Angelos. The cities were taken back just in time for that other great Latin pastime of crusading. I say this in jest, but it's jarring how quickly all of these events start to cascade. The Third Crusade was called almost 100 years after the first. Saladin, with whom the Byzantines had hedged their bets by entering into an alliance, captured Jerusalem in 1187, and warriors of Western Christendom marched east to take it back. By that time, it was clear East Rome was no longer a friend to the Crusades. Isaac II fought on and off and blocked the path of the German crusading army under the command of Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, which delayed it for months. Finally, Barbarossa wised up and took Philippopolis and Adrianople, and was marching towards Constantinople when Isaac II, fearful of a sack similar to Thessalonica five years earlier, caved in and granted the German army passage across the Bosphorus. Perhaps in retaliation for delaying the German army, Richard I of England, or otherwise known as Richard the Lionheart, took the former Byzantine island of Cyprus for himself in 1191. The Third Crusade, of course, ended in failure, and the West, the Germans most of all, would not forget that. By the last decade of the 12th century, the gaze of the West would shift from the holy cities of Palestine, an increasingly difficult area to reconquer, to the riches of Constantinople. Henry VI, son of Barbarossa, and Holy Roman Emperor since the death of his father during the Third Crusade had been planning another crusade when he unexpectedly died in 1197. He had planned to take Constantinople on his way to reconquer Syria and Palestine and had already squeezed tribute out of the new emperor, Alexios III Angelos, who had recently usurped, blinded, and imprisoned his brother Isaac II. Again, a weak succession. There's something to be said about the humiliation of Alexios III emperor of the actual Roman Empire, must have felt paying tribute to the Pope-proclaimed Holy Roman Emperor. For those of you who don't know, Holy Roman Emperor was the title handed down from the Pope to the leader of the Holy Roman Empire, a multi-ethnic confederation of nations in and around modern-day Germany and Italy. As far as the Pope was concerned, he and the Holy Roman Emperor co-ruled Christendom, the former spiritually through the Catholic Church and the latter secularly as the premier Christian ruler of all Christian rulers, a successor of sorts to the line of Western Roman emperors. Naturally, the Byzantine emperors hated the idea of competing for imperial legitimacy, but by the time of Henry VI, the Holy Roman Empire was the most powerful state in Europe, having just incorporated the kingdom of Sicily to its vast domains, and therefore, in German and papal eyes at the very least, was the inheritor of the Western Roman Empire. What it would mean to unite the two empires was not lost in Henry VI, Although the Holy Roman Empire's Grand Crusade would never come to pass, the idea of squeezing tribute out of the Eastern Christians had taken hold amongst the Latins. It had permeated so much that Eastern Christian cities, chiefly Constantinople, would wind up paying for Pope Innocent III's call in 1198 to finish what was attempted in the Third Crusade. This was the beginning of the Fourth Crusade. Three prominent French barons would answer the Pope's call, chief among them Theobald III of Champagne. In order to reach the Holy Land in Palestine, the 12,000-man crusading army needed ships to carry them across the Mediterranean. Venice was the primary candidate for such a fleet, as it had become one of the greatest sea powers of the day to protect its Mediterranean and commercial interests. The Doge of Venice of course accepted the proposal to transport the army in exchange for a high fee and a guarantee that Venice would share equally in the conquest. But the plans would soon change. The crusade leaders, instead of attacking Palestine as the Pope had called for, secretly planned to attack Egypt, as they believed the campaign there would be more harmful to the Turks than if they landed in Palestine. This idea had merit, as Egypt was a major trading hub that brought much-needed timber from the west in exchange for spices from the east, and the enemy would not expect a crusading army to attack so far away from the Holy Land. Fatefully for the Byzantines, this would not be the only time the crusaders would change course. So how does a crusade for Egypt wind up in Constantinople. There are three factors to consider. First, negotiations between the French and Venetians had finalized by 1201. But by this time, the crusade had lost its leader, Theobald III. The man chosen to replace him was Boniface of Montferrat, a vassal of the Holy Roman Empire whose family had played prominent roles in the previous crusades. Up until this point, 
All crusading eyes were on Palestine, unaware of the Egyptian destination. But Boniface instead looked to the east, where he had the opportunity to lay claim to a great Byzantine city. It was said that Emperor Emmanuel I had given Boniface his relative, Rainier of Montferrat, the city of Thessalonica, when he married Emmanuel I's daughter years prior. Seizing the city, which was no longer ruled by Montferrat, was a likely motivation for Boniface to take the lead of the crusading army. The second factor was money, or lack thereof. When the barons had negotiated with Venice, the latter anticipated a force of 30,000 to sail from the northern Italian city. As a result, the Venetians built a fleet that was large enough to carry that amount of men. However, when it was past time to embark in the summer of 1202, only 12,000 crusaders had been assembled, and even with extra coin from the barons, the crusaders did not have enough money to pay the Venetians. Naturally, the Venetians refused to set sail until they offered a compromise. In exchange for the Venetian fleet, the crusading army was to retake Zara from the Hungarians, who had been encouraging the Venetian towns in Dalmatia to rebel and seek Hungarian protection. Now, the Hungarians were a Christian kingdom, so the decision wasn't made lightly, but the choices were attack Zara and make enough money to resume the crusade against the infidels, or don't attack Zara and lose all the money they paid for thus far, not to mention go home in disgrace. In the end, the crusade leaders decided to besiege the Christian city, much to the disapproval of the Pope, but not before an exiled imperial heir appeared. This was to be the third factor that would shift the momentum of the crusade to the east. Alexios Angelos, yep, another one, son of the deposed Emperor Isaac II, had recently been smuggled out of the Byzantine Empire, where he was imprisoned by his uncle, Emperor Alexios III. To avoid confusion, I'll refer to this new Alexios as Young Alexios. Young Alexios was said to be on his way to the court of his brother-in-law and German king, Philip of Swabia, when he had reached out to the crusading army, which was about to embark to Zara. At the last minute, Montferrat took interest in his plight. There is, however, reason to believe this was the plan all along, as the young Alexios may have been in talks with the Latins a year before the crusading army embarked. While not concrete, the plot benefits all the key players. The exiled prince saw the army as a way to claim his throne. Boniface saw young Alexios as a way to claim Thessalonica. The Pope saw unification of the two churches, and the Venetian doge saw money bags. Zara would fall in two weeks, and the army, which by now included Venetian soldiers, wintered there in 1202. Many crusaders protested and stayed out of the actual fighting, and those who took part were excommunicated by an outraged pope. Defections ran rampant. It was a Christian city they had sacked after all, when one of their chief duties was to protect Christians in the east. The army was greatly reduced by these defections, so much so that a proposal from Philip of Swabia and young Alexios was immediately accepted. The Latins would help young Alexios recover the Byzantine throne in exchange for bringing the eastern churches under the papacy, funding from Philip of Swabia, and a Greek army to help finish the crusade, which was on the face ultimately headed for Palestine. As you might imagine, many of the crusaders who had already opposed the attack of Zara, but nonetheless stayed with the army, refused to assault another Christian city, and instead left immediately for the Holy Land. Pope Innocent III wrote to Boniface in June 1203, forbidding him to attack Constantinople, but the army had already left Zara before the ink dried. From there, they reached Byzantine Dyrrhachium and then Corfu, where the Greek people were hostile to the Latin-backed young Alexios. This hostility would be a reoccurring theme for the exiled prince. Constantinople's navy was in rough shape when the Latins finally reached Chalcedon on the Asian side of the Bosphorus on June 24, 1203. With 20 rotting and hastily assembled ships, the Byzantine fleet was no match for the more than 200 Venetian ships. The walls were in disrepair, and at most the city could count on a core group of 15,000 soldiers to defend it against the crusading army, which had swelled well beyond its original 12,000 soldiers, despite the defections. However, Alexius III, in typical imperial fashion, refused to surrender when he sent an envoy to the crusaders, 
demanding to know why they had landed in force in Byzantine territory. The Crusaders then tried to appeal to the people of Constantinople, sailing young Alexios as close as they could to the sea walls so they could show the people their prince. But instead of being met with cheers, they were met with arrows. The only option left was a siege, which would start June 5th. The French landed in Galata, a suburb across the Golden Horn from Constantinople, and pushed back a Byzantine force there, while the Venetians broke into the Golden Horn itself and destroyed the tiny Byzantine fleet. Despite many Byzantine sorties, it took the army little time to prepare for their main assault. The French threw themselves against the land walls on July 17th, but were repulsed by Alexios III's Varangian guard. Meanwhile, the Venetians had captured several towers along the seawall, and had begun burning buildings within to even the odds against the overwhelming Byzantine defenders, but retreated after receiving news that the Byzantines had beaten back the French and were preparing a sortie to finish them off. But the sortie ended in failure, and Alexius III fled Constantinople that night. Immediately, the imprisoned and blinded Isaac II was freed, and the concessions asked for by the Crusaders were agreed to. But the danger was far from over. Young Alexios was crowned Alexios IV on August 1st, 1203, and co-ruled alongside Isaac II. But the crusading army remained in a suburb across the Golden Horn in order to collect their payments as promised by the new emperor. The pope, who hadn't heard anything from the crusaders in Zara, was furious. The prospect of bringing the Greek church under the authority of Rome did little to stop him from demanding the crusading army leave at once for the Holy Land. But Alexios IV needed more time to pay off the Latins, and to secure his position as a ruler in a city where the people had already demonstrated with deadly force that they did not like their leaders cozying up to Westerners. His people grew angrier by the day, especially as he melted down religious vessels, to pay off his debt to the crusading army. Also on their list of grievances was the promise of unification between the two churches, and Alexios's fraternization with the crusading leaders. This culminated in the pillaging of the Venetian merchant quarters within Constantinople, to which the Latins retaliated by starting a fire that ravaged much of the city. These actions would again lead to war, as Alexios IV had no choice but to give the crusading army the cold shoulder and delay payments. Yet, despite his efforts to appeal to his Greek subjects, Alexios IV was overthrown and killed by yet another Alexios, who was confusingly enough the son-in-law of Alexios III. This new emperor, Alexios V Dukas, restored the city's defenses and personally fought in skirmishes against the Crusaders. It was at this moment more than ever one can see the Roman idealism clashing with reality. In the idealism corner, you have the Greeks turning to fire and murder to express their disdain for the Latins, but also showing valiant displays of bravery. Alexios I will nearly die leading a sortie, protecting a religious icon as his men are being overrun. In the reality corner, the Latins are winning the war and the lightning pace of imperial succession does nothing to help the situation. In fact, it was at this time that the leadership of the Latin army decided to take Constantinople and divide the Byzantine Empire amongst themselves. The crusade be damned. The attackers assaulted the sea walls on April 9th and again April 12th, using freighters to grapple giant flying bridges onto the towers so soldiers could attack the walls. Others disembarked first and scaled the walls from the ground. The Latins broke through on the second assault and stopped for the day to gather their strength just in front of the gate they had opened. Fearing a counterattack that night, the attackers burned down another large portion of the city. By now, Constantinople had been absolutely wrecked, but the carnage wasn't over. Like his father-in-law before him, Alexios V fled into the night when things looked dire. Unfortunately for his people, there was no one left to settle the rage of the Latin army. The Varangian guard, who had valiantly protected the city a year before, now abandoned their posts for want of more pay. The crusaders thoroughly sacked Constantinople, with all the terrible things that come with a sacking. That includes mass looting, rape, and murder, amongst other horrors. Nikitas Coniotes, a contemporary Byzantine historian, was in Constantinople when it was sacked. In the Harry J. Magolius translation of Coniotes Historia, Coniotes describes how the Latin army met no resistance on the morning of April 13th, and how the people, in an attempt to appeal to their attackers' better nature, lined the streets to greet them. But it didn't matter by that point, as the attackers were at the end of their rope. Coniotes lays out what happened as the soldiers entered the city. 
He writes, The narrow streets were clear and the crossroads unobstructed, safe from attack and advantageous to the enemy. The population, moved by the hope of propitiating them, had turned out to greet them with crosses and venerable icons of Christ, as was custom during festivals of solemn processions. But there, the attackers' disposition was not at all affected by what they saw, nor did their lips break into the slightest smile, nor did the unexpected spectacle transform their grim and frenzied glance and fury into a semblance of cheerfulness. Instead, they plundered with impunity and stripped their victims shamelessly, beginning with their carts. Not only did they rob them of their substance, but also of the articles consecrated to God. The rest fortified themselves around with defensive weapons, as their horses were roused at the sound of a war trumpet. Further on, he continues, The whole head was in pain. There were lamentations and cries of woe, and weeping in the narrow ways, wailing at the crossroads, moaning in the temples, outcries of men, screams of women, the taking of captives and the dragging about, tearing in pieces and raping of bodies heretofore sound and whole. They who were bashful of their sex were led about naked. They who were venerable in their old age uttered plaintive cries, and the wealthy were despoiled of their riches. Thus it was in the squares, thus it was in the corners, thus it was in the temples, thus it was in the hiding places. For there was no place that could escape detection or that could offer asylum to those who came streaming in. After the city was thoroughly sacked, the Latins had rounded up enough coin to pay the Venetians for their fleet and make the crusading leaders rich until the end of their days. The empire was divided into four main Latin states and several Venetian colonies that dotted the coast of Greece and the Aegean Sea. The premier state was the Latin Empire, which encompassed Constantinople and stretched just past Adrianople in the west and Nicomedia in the east. The kingdom of Thessalonica, which was ruled by Boniface, of course, encompassed much of Macedonia. Two smaller states divided southern Greece. Constantinople itself was divided amongst Venice and the rest of the Latins, and everyone within the Latin states swore fealty to the emperor, at least all who remained. Much of Constantinople's more wealthy residents, like Coniotes, fled the city, some even before the Latins arrived. Half of the refugees migrated to northwestern Greece, where the Byzantine Empire's chief European successor state, the Despotate of Epirus, was formed. In Anatolia, another successor state was formed just across the Bosphorus from Constantinople by another son-in-law of Alexius III, this time, thankfully, with a different name, Theodore I Lascaris. His brother had attempted a final defense of Constantinople the day it fell, but could not rouse even the hardened Varangian guard. This state was known as the Empire of Nicaea, and from the day of its conception, it vied with the despotate of Epirus to take back Constantinople and reclaim the empire. While the two successor states did much to reclaim the empire over the next 57 years, the Latins would do a lot of damage to themselves as well. Divided as they were, they were perhaps even more vulnerable to attacks from the various kingdoms that had cropped up in Eastern Europe at the end of the 12th century, and from the native populations they ruled over. Boniface and his kingdom of Thessalonica crumbled to the Bulgars by 1207, and the two Latin states to the south were slowly ground down to emaciated versions of themselves. But to their credit, they did survive into the 15th century. And the Latin Empire, chief of all the Latin states, had shrunk to the areas immediately surrounding Constantinople by 1225. As the Latin states contracted, Epirus and Nicaea grew. The western state retook Thessalonica and Adrianople by 1225, and the eastern state kicked the Franks out of Anatolia in 1224 and beat the encroaching Seljuks back in 1231. Now you'd think it would be in their best interest to work in concert with each other, but instead the two states did what Romans do and saw each other as rivals for imperial legitimacy. Luckily for Nicaea, Epirus's gains would be reversed by the Bulgars in 1230, and in the following decade, much of Macedonia, including Thessalonica, would be in Nicaean hands due to reconquest. Finally, in June 1261, in what has to be one of the most anticlimactic moments in history, the Nicaean general took Constantinople while the city was virtually defenseless. A month later, Emperor Michael Peleologos 
who co-ruled Nicaea alongside 10-year-old John IV, entered the run-down and depopulated city and was crowned Byzantine emperor. By winter, he had the boy blinded. Old habits die hard, I suppose. The 11th and 12th centuries can be seen as the wearing down of the Eastern Roman Empire from its Western cousins, the Robert Guisgars of the world. The East tried in vain to use the West to make up for its own deficiencies, and the West took advantage of those deficiencies. I'm reminded of the Coen Brothers film Fargo, in which a man hires thugs to take his wife hostage so he can split the ransom her father is sure to pay. If you haven't seen it, it's a classic, and you should stop this podcast right now to watch it because there are major spoilers ahead. Okay, here it goes. So when the thugs finally get their hands on the ransom, they keep it for themselves because they are the ones in power. They are the ones in power because they are the ones wielding the guns, not the scheming husband. Likewise, the Normans, the Kingdom of Sicily, the Holy Roman Empire, the Kingdom of France, and Venice at different times were the ones with the gun. The Byzantines were like the scheming husband who had no way to stop the West from their encroachments. We can see now that Roman superiority complex at work, creating blind spots, which though not every emperor fell victim, were made all the larger by a crumbling empire. Yet there is something positive to be said about feelings of Roman superiority. That is the Roman will to survive. Although foreigners in a strange land, the Latin rulers' failure to protect themselves from outside and internal forces stands as a testament to the Byzantine Empire's ability to stay alive through sheer force of will, despite a series of disasters leading up to the 12th century. That same force shot them out of the darkness of the 13th century and back into the light of the eastern eternal city. These were the same people, after all, who in the 3rd century BCE saw three Roman armies shatter back to back to back against Hannibal and still would not submit to foreign rule. When you have that kind of history, it's hard not to believe you're invincible. <laughs>